So um, I'm back again and my talk is an extension of the talk which was given by um, uh, Roya Zendi uh, at the end of last quarter. I'm gonna talk about viruses, but it's a kind of different virus than Roya talked about. I'm gonna talk about the retroviruses. Um, so uh, these are much larger than the viruses which were discussed by Roya and they have profound differences in some aspects. Um, that is worth multiple talks. I'm just going to skim over it and then get to the heart of the uh, uh, question I want to discuss with you. So on the left, you see here, um, can you see my cursor, by the way? Uh, no? Yes, yes, that's showing up. Okay, it's not very good. All right. So on the left, you see here a cryo-electron microscopy image of a cell which has been infected by HIV and which is uh, on the point of producing a new virus. So you can see a kind of thick layer um, just below the cell membrane. So you see here the cell membrane over there. And there is a kind of thick layer you see here, which is composed of uh, viral proteins called capsid proteins. Um, Roya mentioned us already. Um, well, here they are, the viral capsid proteins. So this is like a snapshot. And if you wait uh, a short period, oh, I forgot. Just the viral, the, the business part of the virus in, for HIV is RNA, single-stranded RNA, uh, about 20,000 bases. And it is, it is covering the interior here. You, can, you cannot see it really on this because the, the uh, uh, viral capsid proteins, the scattering of them overwhelms that of the viral RNA. But the viral RNA here aligns the interior. Uh, it's bound to it electrostatically. Okay, so we call this the bud. It's the first step in uh, the large scale phenomenology of the formation of a virus. Sometime later, this uh, sphere closes on itself and pinches off from the um, uh, uh, cell membrane. You can see though that uh, as outlined here in the red circle, the uh, capsids, capsid proteins don't cover the whole shell. It's about 60, 70%. That's already a little bit strange because the viruses you heard from Roya are beautiful, perfect structures. HIV is a hot mess. Uh, so it has these big holes there. Uh, it still has a lipid bilayer on the outside. So this there is an, an, a lipid bilayer which has been stolen from the host cell. You can see here, uh, uh, proteins sticking out. These are like the famous stalk proteins you've seen. Well, never mind. They are somewhat like the stalk proteins you've seen from pictures of the coronavirus. And you can also see that the lipid bilayer has been disorganized over there. So we have here now a uh, single thick shell, and we call that the immature virus. It is not yet infectious. Then there is some sort of magical act. And sometimes later, this structure wholly reorganizes itself as if it is, was kind of alive. Um, you get two thin shells and the RNA is contained in the inner shell. You see this kind of ice cream cone, that's the inner shell. And we have an outer shell here. Uh, why HIV has two shells is not fully understood. I have proposed a reason why, and I can tell you that uh, if you are interested, why it has reorganized into two shells rather than one shell. This is the mature virus and it is infectious, ready to attack another white blood cell. So you probably know that HIV cells, uh, most HIV viruses mostly attack white blood cells and uh, the cells of the immune system. Here is um, a kind of cleaned up uh, cartoon picture of what you just saw. In yellow, we have again the lipid bilayer, which is not really a lipid bilayer, it's festooned with proteins, but never mind. Here are the capsid proteins, which are lining the bud. Here you see the stalk proteins, which are going to recognize proteins in the surface of the uh, uh, new cells. 
And the RNA here is this very thin little red line. I can tell you why this is. It's because there are two RNA molecules which have been spliced together over there. Um, here you see the big hole. It is burning off. It still has this hole. This is the immature virus. And then during maturation, this thick shell breaks up into a thin shell, the outer shell, and an inner shell, which is ice cream cone shaped, which contains the membrane, uh, which contains the viral RNA. Um, just for your information, what happens during maturation is that the capsid proteins get cut into one, two, three, four, five places. And each of these subunits plays an important role. For example, this section is going to make up the capsid proteins of the new mature cone-like virus. But that's not for this talk. Uh, the, lipid, the cell membrane, we're going to treat like a lipid bilayer. OK, um, so what is the subject of my talk? The subject of my talk is an observation which has been made on HIV and also of other viruses which are enveloped, viruses which are surrounded by a lipid bilayer, which can contain proteins, which does contain proteins. And it is this. The budding process is spontaneous up to a point. Spontaneous meaning is that it doesn't consume free energy, it just is running the free energy downhill. What is different of HIV is that it stalls. It stops. It stops after the neck has formed. And it just sits there for five, 10 minutes or something like that. And what happens is that the host cell uh, voluntarily sends in a certain kind of protein machinery called escort, E-S-C-R-T. The escort machinery, um, it is actually building a ring here, a contractile ring of the type you probably have heard about how, how bacteria divide. A contractile ring forms here, it's not actin, which then actively pinches it off. And for life scientists, they, that's no, it's clear why it happens because this neck is energetically costly according to them. So you need such a cell machinery to pinch it off. I think that is completely wrong. So the life science community believes that the delay, the stalling, has to do with the time required to construct this escort machinery, which is not one protein, but a whole uh, smorgasbord of protein. Uh, the escort machinery is uh, essential for endocytotic processes in the Golgi uh, and the endoplasmatic reticulum. So um, the life science community entirely focuses here on the escort machinery. Um, now, I'm going to go back in time to 1992 when Reinhard Lipovsky uh, studied another form of budding. That kind of budding is produced by lipid bilayers composed of two kinds of lipids, alpha and beta, that do not mix. Uh, if you take lipid bilayers, in fact, if you take any surfactant bilayer surface and you have made, you composed it of two types of lipid, then you can see budding. You can see phase separation, but sometimes this phase separation produces budding. And this is a very strange type of phase separation. It is actually two-dimensional phase separation in three-dimensional space. So let me explain that. So look at this picture over here. Oh, there is my cursor. We start with an, a lipid bilayer, which is composed of lipids alpha and beta, which phase separate, here forming a little puddle. Uh, now, this little puddle of beta has an interfacial line tension, but it likes to compress it. Now, normally, if this was in a two-dimensional space, that's all there is to it. But because you're in a three-dimension, it's embedded in a three-dimensional space, this puddle of beta can pop out into the, uh, third, into the third dimension and it pinches off. So, um, sorry, excuse me. This form of uh, budding is completely spontaneous. In fact, it goes faster and faster because you have a kind of two-dimensional capillary pressure which diverges like one over the radius of the neck, which makes it go very quickly. 
So the butt of beta pops out into the third dimension due to line tension. Uh, the line tension pinches off the vesicle. And when you now apply this healthy formalism, which I outlined in the beginning, uh, which was done by Lipovsky, uh, there is no activation barrier. Well, you need to get it started. There is here phase separation, and that may have a bit of a barrier, but there is no barrier associated with the pinch off. Um, so uh, this type of theory has been well confirmed by studies of two component lipid bilayers. Uh, so um, let's move on and ask ourselves now, what's wrong with HIV? We have here a beautiful mechanism which has no activation barrier. It just, it just pops off bubbles like nuts. Okay. Um, uh, the key point here is that wormholes, when you form this, this, this is a kind of wormhole. And I've showed you before that for a minimal surface, a wormhole is not a problem. It doesn't have a high energy. It just goes. Now, so can we, like people have done, can we just apply the Lipovsky theory to HIV and other membrane enveloped viruses? Well, um, it's not quite the same. And the key point here is this symmetry. The capsid proteins are asymmetric. They break the symmetry. They are curvature generating. And you can test it. If you take a lipid bilayer and you put in these capsid proteins, it will start to curve. So the capsid proteins generate the curvature and in fact determine, for the case of HIV, the radius of the immature virus. So you break the up-down symmetry. Well, is that going to spoil the Lipovsky theory? Is budding perhaps just a form of phase separation of the Lipovsky type? So in order to answer that question, um, we collaborated with the wonderful group of Mike Hagen in Brandeis, who did in a different context, numerical simulations that was for the alpha virus. So let me tell you how these simulations work. Um, so one moment. So they start from a toy model of the capsid proteins. The capsid proteins are modeled as three cones, uh, asymmetric cones, sorry, symmetric cones, but without up-down symmetry. Three of these together form one protein. Um, the green part you can think of as, whoops, my computer did something funny. The, uh, the green part you can think of as hydrophobic and the purple part as hydrophilic. So if you have multiple proteins, then purple repels purple, uh, green attacks green and green repels purple because this is hydrophilic, this is hydrophobic and this is hydrophilic. Now, if you put a whole bunch of these type of triplets together, then because of the attractive energy, green attacks green, you're going to form a shell determined by the attractive energy between these triplets. So we're, I'm discussing now the model used by Michael Hagen to simulate the capsid proteins. Um, if you have sufficiently many of them, you get a closed sphere and the radius of curvature of the sphere is simply determined by the curvature of these triplets. The minimum free energy state of a cluster of these proteins is a hollow spherical shell. Okay, so that's the first part. This is our toy model for the uh, 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 mature capsid. Now we also need to model the lipids. The lipids are modeled uh, again as uh, composed of three units. Now these are three spheres which are flexible. Um, Yellow here um, attracts yellow, just as green attracted green before. Um, blue repels blue, that is the head groups repelling each other, and blue repels green. So if you put lots of these together, then it beautifully self-assembles into a thermally fluctuating lipid bilayer, where this green, this green here is that blue and yellow still is yellow. 
Um, you can see here that a few molecules have escaped from this lipid bilayer and floating around. Uh, they are in thermal equilibrium with the sheet itself. So this is just a snapshot of a fluctuating lipid bilayer. So um, in past work, people have shown that these kind of these kind of models show all can be described by the same Helfrich free, free energy, which I discussed in the tutorial. Uh, the final step is, is that we're going to insert the model proteins in the, or we, uh, Mike and his group, insert the model proteins in the model lipid bilayers, where you see that yellow attacks green. And so they're going to spontaneously sit in the lipid bilayers. So um, you, you end up with a kind of uh, green uh, meadow with, uh, with these ugly plants sticking in it. They're thermally fluctuating. It's a, remember, it's a 2D uh, fluid, and it is fluctuating in two ways, one in terms of the concentration of the proteins, C of R and T, you remember, and the other one in terms of the shape. So here now is the simulation of Mike. On the top, you see um, the formation uh, in a cross section, and in the bottom, you see what it looks from the outside. So you see how quickly it starts to form a capsid. Um, very nice. You see here a half formed capsid. The proteins which haven't yet assembled are shown in brown and the orange are shown in purple. Notice that this goes very quickly. Here you start to see uh, the neck appearing with its negative Gauss curvature. The uh, capsid itself has a positive Gauss curvature. And here you still have this fluctuating membrane. Uh, so this is all going very swimmingly, and it is a form of safe phase separation, no question about it. However, you saw this little flesh, that means that you have to sit there for a long time, twiddling and twiddling and twiddling and twiddling, nothing happens. Until after a long time and flogging your computer, it suddenly pops off, and there we have our minimum free energy state. We have, a, we have here a kind of toy simulation of the uh, formation of a an, uh, an, uh, toy virus. So here is the key conclusion. Simulation reproduces stalling. There is a difference between this and the Lipovsky theory. This one, uh, even though it is a far cry from the molecular complexity of the system, stalls. So why does it stall? Okay, we have now a laboratory uh, in which we can test our theories and our ideas. So here you see a snapshot of the state when it is stalling. And let's try to analyze this picture thermodynamically. First, the proteins, the capsid proteins spontaneously assemble here in this cluster. In terms of the language of the chemical potential, that means that the chemical potential must be very low in this uh, uh, capsid state. In fact, it's in the minimum free energy state. So no surprise here, it self assembles into towards the hollow sphere, which is the minimum free energy state. So this state, which has positive Gauss curvature, has a low chemical potential. Uh, I want to remind you that the mean curvature here is one over the radius. Next, let's go a little bit down and look at this um, uh, neck region. I don't know if you noticed, but do you know? But in fact, the concentration of proteins outside the neck region in the lipid bilayer is much higher than the neck region itself. It seems to avoid the neck region. So it has a high chemical potential there. Again, the fund foundations of non equilibrium dynamics here are you look for gradients of the chemical potential. And the chemical potential is evidently high over here, even though this is a surface of zero mean curvature. It's a minimum surface, minimal surface. But it does seem to, and even though in terms of the theory of, li of lipid bilayers, it shouldn't be costly, these proteins avoid it. Finally, the lipid bilayer in here has an intermediate mu because the density over here is higher than there, but lower than there. So uh, we have apparently intermediate mu, a high mu, and low mu. So there is a kind of free energy barrier here, but it has to do with the transport of the proteins from the lipid bilayer towards the surface. 
And the key point here is that this is a region of positive Gauss curvature, the capsid itself. This is a region of negative Gauss curvature. Evidently, for the proteins, they hate uh, negative Gauss curvature. They avoid it. So we can now use our little expansion. The chemical potential is one part which is taking care of the diffusion, which goes at the natural logarithm of the concentration, standard solution theory. And then we have our lowest order terms, A1H, A2K, A3H squared. This is different from the healthy theory, but it is basically the same arguments why these three terms appear. It's the same physics in terms of symmetry. Now, um, what can we say about these coefficients? Actually, you can say a lot about these coefficients. Um, and that is by demanding that if you have a dense layer of these proteins, then uh, you should reproduce the Helfrich energy, not for the lipid bilayer, but for the capsid. So that means that this coefficient A3 over H squared, that should be the bending stiffness of the capsid times the area per protein. Um, A1, should be minus the bending energy, bending modulus of the capsid divided by the curvature radius. And finally, A2 should be the Gauss curvature of the um, uh, capsid. And that means that A2 is negative, all right? And then you say, aha, this is fantastic. Why? Because we see from the simulation that the Gauss curvature um, should be an inhibitory factor and yes, the Gauss curvature, the despised Gauss curvature, which in standard theory of lipid bilayers plays no role, here plays a key role. It provides for the diffusing proteins a region where the chemical potential is high because the Gauss curvature is negative. A2 is negative for the very same reason that it is negative for uh, lipid bilayers. You need to stabilize the sphere. And only if the Gauss curvature is negative um, sorry, the Gauss curvature module is negative, is the sphere and minimum energy state. So now we have, we can start to go to our uh, uh, equation here. This is the equation we have to solve. I hope you remember it from the tutorial. This is the continuity equation. This is the chemical potential. This term is the current times uh, uh, transport coefficient, which is uh, the mobility. And you have to take the divergence of this and set it to zero. But watch out, it's a curved surface. So you have to use curvy linear coordinates and the whole mess. Suffice it to say that in some ways you can do that. And I'm just going to show you uh, the results. So here are the results. So the vertical axis here is the current. The current is the number of proteins absorbed by the patch per second. It's the growth rate. The horizontal um, uh, axis is the fraction of capsid assembly. So a hemisphere would be over here. Oh, it's to the square root one half. So anyway, the fraction of capsid assembly is one half. Uh, then you need to take the square root and you get somewhere over here, I guess. Um, um, sorry, Robin, quick interruption, about a minute and a half left. Perfect. I'm nearly done. So let's see uh, what happens. Uh, if we run the simulation, then first the current goes up and it goes up because you have uh, a larger and larger parameter. Then it starts to go down. And when it starts to go down, that is associated with this pinch off, with the fact that you're stalling because you now start to get this big energy barrier for diffusing proteins uh, to get from the uh, extensive lipid bilayer into the capsid. That's where it goes to zero. Here you can see that there's a deviation because even though the continuum theory claims uh, that there shouldn't be any budding, in reality, there is budding. There is some budding. You saw it. If you wait long enough, there is a rate at which uh, viruses form. It's just shown over here. Uh, that's because that involves a microscopic process, which is not in continuum theory. The reference for the uh, full calculation is given below. So uh, one quick thing about Gauss-Bonnet again, in Gauss-Bonnet, the mean curvature of the lipid bilayer is supposed to be zero because that's how we start out with. 
uh, for the budding state, the mean curvature should still be zero. That's the, that's the Gauss Bonnet theorem applied to this surface. So it is pure math here. I'm not talking about uh, physics here. The capsid has a positive Gauss curvature with an air, with an uh, uh, curvature uh, one over R. So you get one over R squared and that area increases with time as it grows. The neck area with negative Gauss, Gauss curvature, its area decreases in time. In order to maintain a mean Gauss curvature, which is zero, the um, negative Gauss curvature of the neck must strongly increase in time. Its area decrease, this area increases and you have to keep on, you have to fight it because Gauss Bonnet forces you to fight it. So you, you need this kind of divergence of the negative Gauss curvature in the neck simply by the Gauss Bonnet theorem. And that's, that strangles the transport of the capsid proteins to reach the uh, capsid itself. So in summary, stalling we claim is an intrinsic feature of budding driven by curvature generic proteins. It is not represented because of this asymmetry, it is not represented by the Lipovsky theory. The curvature generating proteins of uh, uh, viral assembly are a completely separate phenomenon. Viral budding is fundamentally different from the Lipovsky mechanism. The Gauss Bonnet theorem generates a geometrical curvature trap. Eventually, proteins can barely enter or leave, and that's causing the stalling. So, can we apply that? Does it help us uh, think of therapies for HIV? Well, you need to stop this escort machinery. So it would inhibit budding not of all membrane enveloped viruses, not of HIV, but all membrane enveloped viruses, which would be great. Unfortunately, um, it has been tried. Suppression of escort actually produces neurological disorders. So that's where our biology research ugly head. Uh, the escort machinery is necessary to overcome this fundamental physics effect of stalling, uh, but because it is vital, you cannot get rid of it. And with that, I would like to finish my talk and thank you for your attention. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so we have a large number of questions. We'll, we'll get started with a couple now and then do as many as we can during the informal discussion for people who can stick around. So um, I want to start with an early one from Dylan Steer, who asked if during budding, does the virus, when it's forming the bud, exclude non-viral membrane proteins, or do host membrane proteins come with it? As far as I know, it, um, it's just what people call zone refining in solid state physics. You expel the membrane proteins, which uh, um, are part and I'm going to take it back. I don't know the re I'm assuming that it's expelling them because you want to form a roughly hexagonal lattice with the uh, capsid proteins. But to be honest, I don't know. I know that it certainly includes the uh, um, proteins which are necessary for attaching to the surface of a new host cell. So it's a good question. I've never thought about it. Now I think about it because it can it can include those proteins, which are viral proteins. I bet you that there might be some uh, intrinsic membrane proteins from the cell left over as well, but I don't know the answer to your question. Good question. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so, so Rafael Petrosian asked if um, this could kind of be tested in a reconstituted system. Basically, could you take HIV particles H, uh, proteins, lipids, and RNA, inject them into lipid vesicles and see if that can induce budding even mm -hmm. outside a cell. Do you know if experiments like that have been tried? Uh, I think that would be an absolutely fantastic experiment because you never are sure. You want to show, you would like, you would love to reproduce the stalling without the cell doing all kinds of stuff like the escort machinery. So that hasn't been done. Um, personally, I can tell you that you, when you work with uh, uh, experts on HIV, you have a hard time to convince them of the viewpoint of a physicist. Uh, it would be a lot of work and reconstituted system, uh, they just raise their eyebrows uh, at that. So you'd have to find this rare animal, which is a person who knows everything about HIV and who is interested in soft matter physics. So it that experiment would be great. It hasn't been done. Okay. Um, thanks. So, so we'll do one more before we go to the informal discussion. Um, Hao Wu asked if you could explain 
um, in a little bit more why the chemical potential depends on the expansion of the mean curvature and Gaussian curvature in the theory. Okay. So uh, I guess this is going back to the tutorial a little bit, but yeah. Sure. Uh, but let me answer it for this particular case. All right. So um, why would it depend on the mean curvature? Well, first, do you remember that these proteins break symmetry? They're asymmetric. So they generate curvature. And that is embedded and that is expressed in this term. These, these, um, these proteins need to bend the membrane. We know they do it. And so you need to have a term which um, is uh, uh, driving that bending. And that would, if you use a layer of capsid proteins with this chemical potential, then this term would produce a spontaneous curvature of the capsid. Now, if you have a linear term like that, you also need a quadratic term to stop the spontaneous uh, curvature. Uh, otherwise, it would just grow in an unlimited way. The region, region, sorry, the reason why we have this term, why we must have this term, came from the analysis of this picture. By analyzing this picture, you could see that these membrane proteins congregated in region of positive Gauss curvature and avoided a uh, region of negative Gauss curvature. These three terms are allowed by symmetry, but moreover, they are also imposed. Basically, you, the final argument would be to say, if I fully assemble a shell, then I could try to construct a healthy energy for this shell. And then you have the same three terms which we have for the healthy term of the lipid bilayer.